Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Cheryl Klein. I'm the editorial director at Lee and Lowe Books, and I am here today with Sherry Thomas, wonderful author of many, many, many books, and uh, particularly The Magnolia Sword, I'm retelling of Mulan. And um, I had to show it on my phone because I'm working from home and I don't have a copy of the book here. So oh, I, sh I, sh I should have, I should drag one of mine from across the room. I didn't think about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, the book came out just about a year ago um, this month. And uh, obviously, like, Disney just released their movie of Mulan, which was supposed to be released six months ago right. over the weekend. And so we thought it was a great opportunity for us to have a conversation. So thank you for joining us for this Tea Time Talk. It's um, lovely to see you. Yes. And uh, for the attendees, um, down at the bottom, there should be a little chat box of your Zoom window, and you can feel free to type questions in there. Um, and then when we get after Sherry and I have our conversation, um, we'll uh, look at the questions and see if there's anything we haven't yet addressed. Um, and this will be uh, about half an hour. So thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to be with us. Um, so Sherry, this project sort of started with a pitch from me because I I, real, I was looking around and I realized there was no good YA novel about Mulan and I really wanted to read one. Um, so what did you know about the story at the time when I pitched it to you? Like, had you grown up with it in China? Like, what was your... Um, yes, yes, I did grow up uh, with it in China, but the, the story of Mulan is actually like a super simple one. And if you read the original ballad, which I went back to read, uh, um, you realize there's nothing in it. Right. It's basically about the girl going to war and coming to, coming back. It doesn't say anything about her time at war. And okay. so so I think the Disney version was actually what most people were more familiar with. Um, and uh, but that is also not exactly a faithful version. It's you know it's 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 a Disney cartoon for children with dragons and song and dance and and everything in it so. <laughs> yeah i think I'm, I'm i'm now singing one of the songs in my head and i'm sure i'm guessing that a lot of people <laughs> listening might be as well yeah so, um, yeah so what about the idea appealed to you about doing a mulan uh i think the idea that appealed to me was once i look into it um i realized it's basically a blank page to write a story of Mulan because original story says so much and and the Disney story if you take out the song and dance sequences if you take out the little dragon um, there's actually barely enough to fill a children's chapter book right uh, that's why I think uh, at the time I actually asked you specifically once more whether you wanted a like a, a chapter book or you wanted an actual novel and when you said you wanted an actual novel I realized the vista was wide open Right. There's a ton of things to fill in that 80,000 words. Um, and I, my mind immediately turned to uh, wuxia, which is a Chinese martial arts epics genre. Um, it deals about, um, it, 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 it's usually often like family sagas with, um, with everybody being adept in the martial arts. And there will be enmities, there will be friendships, there will be adventures and, um, it's like everything. It's an exploration of the human condition, but with, in, with the pretext that everybody in this, you know, is a great martial really artist. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, I love Wuxia. I read a lot of it growing up. And I was basically like, hey, if, um, if Cheryl at uh, Lee and Lo Books uh, would let me write a uh, Wuxia remake of Mulan, yeah then I'll be really, really interested. Uh, and you said yes. So that was... <laughs> it sounded awesome to me. And I mean, that does play in really well with obviously like, what well, you were saying like the original story is so thin, but what we know is like daughter, father, fighting, basically. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and exactly. That she went and she came back. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that that, that she perfectly. survived the venture. Yeah, that's, that's all right. we know. <laughs> and she right. seemed okay. She seemed okay with it. <laughs> like yeah. very, very even keeled, uh, very level-headed girl. Um, so you went yeah, ahead and you invented this the storyline with two swords and a generational duel. Uh, exactly, because yeah. at, at first I was like, oh, Mulan, yes, um, sure, piece of cake. Everybody knows Mulan goes to war. The, the story the, the, is, is all set, right? 
Right. You know, she goes to work, you know, she fights, you know, she comes back. But when you get down to the specific of actually writing what she does, you realize the general outline tells you nothing. Right. So then you begin the process of having to fill the story up. Like what is there to drive her as a character? What is there to, obviously you, you have the external plot of the war breathing down everybody, but what drives her as a character? What drives her um, uh, inner motivations and all that? So I basically borrowed a trope from, uh, from uh, uh, martial arts epics, which is, actually I don't know if I've ever read anything specifically like it, but it seems likely. You know, it seems like something I could definitely use in a wuxia um, novel. So that's a generational duel. Like, you know, every, every once in a generation, people fight. Um, this, this I have seen. Maybe not every generation for as long, but I have seen, like, people of one generation have this huge difference of opinion, and then they appoint their children to fight it out 20 years later. That right. I have seen in martial arts ethics. I was like, I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And so what did, how did you go and like, did you do a lot of watching Wuxia for like research or writing or did you learn about the period? Um, no, I didn't, I didn't read it or I didn't read or watch any more Wuxia because I have a really, really solid grounding in it from growing <laughs> up. And, um, and, uh, and uh, um, what I first did was uh, familiarize myself with the period. Uh, I, I actually, I realized I actually didn't know much about Chinese history going that far back. Uh, what, what period is it? It's like this, this, is, this, this was set in the, um, so what I researched a little bit about the original ballad of Mulan, it is said that it is first collected in a, in a volume of stories um, in the sixth century. And it is generally ex accepted that the, the story it describes as, as having taken place in the previous century. So that would have been fifth century China. And I look at it and I didn't even know who was in power, what was the political situation or why and any of that. Um, so that was the first thing I uh, went to research, a little historical background for the time. And uh -huh. also another thing I wanted uh, was because it was taking place in a place that was also unfamiliar to me. It's taking place somewhere in the central of China. I grew up uh, on the Eastern coast of China. So and never ventured um, inland. Uh, so I would basically pull up uh, Google Earth to see, um, to, to look at the, st study the geography and oh, had yeah. a nasty shock because i have been using a Google Earth for a long time to do research for my uh, books. Uh, and it's always been like thickly populated with pictures of people who have taken pictures at that particular location. So you can actually see not just, you know, oh, okay, this is an elevation. You can actually see what it looks like um, in that right. general area. But when I went to pull it up, all the pictures were gone. Because apparently at the time I started doing research, uh, Google ended their uh, relationship with Paranormal, which was, was hosting those pictures. And is that like the were, company that was doing it for China specifically? Or was no, that for, like for all the over world? the world for Google Earth. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was how people they were getting their pictures from and there was no pictures very few pictures and i almost had a panic attack right there. <laughs> so yeah those those were where i started with my research to see what the places look like and see what the historical back, background was like yeah and and you i remember we talked a lot about like the ruran and the the khan and were, were they actually mongols and um and all of that Oh, uh, right, because one of the interesting things I discovered in the writing of this book was that, oh, I, I realized I had a very um, limited conception of what it meant to be Chinese, what, what Chinese history was like. Because um, one of the first things I learned was that at the, at the time um, the story of Murong was set in, China was divided into uh, two dynasties, North and South, uh, separated by the um, separated by the Yangtze River, the, the Long River. Um, and, uh, and the dynasty in the north was actually controlled by um, a Xianbei dynasty. And most Chinese in China now identify as what they call ethnic Han, uh, uh -huh. which, uh, which comes, the word comes from the Han dynasty, which ruled China for like 400 years uh, before the story of Mulan. And it was like a very prosperous, it was coeval with the Rome Empire. So you have Rome oh, right, in the West yeah. and the Han Chinese in the, in the East. And it was like a very expensive, very um, 
very powerful um, dynasty and uh, many long centuries of peace and people really, really enjoy living under the Han dynasty and they call themselves um, Han. Um, but what happens is I realized in the subsequent centuries, actually, there was always, there have always been other people living in the north of China. And through migration, through conquest, through assimilation, uh, what was originally the ethnic Han and these nomadic people actually mixed together because we no longer have these nomadic people. And we know that they were not altogether defeated. So right. they became us, we became them. So that was one of the most interesting things I learned about um, this period in Chinese history was that um, the dynasty, even though they were fighting against the nomadic enemy, the dynasty itself was actually ruled by formal nomads. Right. So, so if, if we go back to the Disney situation, uh, the original Disney, um, uh, Disney animated and they were saying the, 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 the Huns were coming over the walls. It would have been people both outside the wall were Huns and the people in power too would have been the Huns too. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually one of my favorite things I think about the book was that you, you, you see Mulan herself learning that in a lot of ways because she's she you made her a character from the south who's in exile in the north and then goes further north to fight right 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 exactly yeah. um i mean e even in the u.s there's a kind of a fairly big north south cultural divide right i think right, it's, right. It's, it's even bigger in china um partly because a lot of times people from the North and South cannot even understand each other linguistically unless they speak like Mandarin. They, if, they, if they speak their local dialect, it's hopeless sometimes. Uh -huh. like, like I cannot understand Cantonese. Uh, a lot of people do not even understand the dialect of Shanghai, which is like somewhere in the middle of the country. Um, so, um, and, and my family is from the South. My family is from uh, Shanghai, from points further South. And we've always lived in the North. I, I grew up in the North. So I, I knew that cultural dialect like dichotomy a little bit myself. Um, but another reason I wanted to set this in the, bring Mulan in as a southerner was because um, she is our point of view character, right? And she herself carries these um, prejudices against the nomadic tribes that she grew up with. Uh, prejudices right. that are, I think, especially um, strong and sometimes outlandish because she has never seen met a, a, a person of nomadic origin. She's only heard about them. She's only read histories written about them and, you know, heard, you know, the stories people make up to scare children to sleep at night. <laughs> right. So, so I wanted her to have that slightly different cultural background. So when she meets them, it is new and she would have to confront her own uh, prejudices. Uh, like she would have to realize in the first place that, oh, she was holding these prejudices in the first place against you know these people of no, no, people of nomadic origins so. and one of them is the character she ends up sort of falling in love with uh the guy kai mm -hmm. yeah yes, and yeah um and what, what when you're putting together a love interest for for other books and of course you've written many romance novels as well as mystery novels and everything else what uh considerations go into setting one up and, and does it make a difference, like whether that character is for an adult novel or a YA novel? Um, I, I have never written um, books for the YA market any differently from uh, how I write uh, uh, other adult novels. Books? Yeah, yeah uh, because every book, is, every book is difficult to write. By the time I finish wrestling with the plot and the characters, it's done. It's like there was never <laughs> any time to consider like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How should I write this differently? Uh, the, the writing itself is, is so time consuming and so mind consuming. I never think about that. Um, so for, for this book, um, for this book, I think um, we, see, we see the love interest introduced and he at first seems like a typical love interest. He is like, you know, handsome and brave and capable and highly skilled. And then... Um, but halfway through, we find out basically he suffers from a lot of phobias. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, because of the way he grew up, he's actually seriously afraid of a lot of things. But uh, he, he kind of just carries on with it. 
and he's pushing through it. Yeah. yeah, he just he just pushes through it. And the way we know um, Mulan is different from other people with him, uh, and that he sees her differently, is because he lets her know. He may or may not let anybody else know that he's actually afraid, but he admits to her that right. he is he is afraid. Uh, and and I think it's it's. It's, it's good for their relationship that he's not afraid to admit it and she does not um, consider him any less for having right. admitted these fears. Because I think by the time uh, she herself also begins to realize like fear is a real thing and fear is just what you have to live with. And sometimes you do things when you're afraid that you're not proud of, but all you can do is next time do better. That's one of the, I mean, I think we talked a lot about Mulan's like journey, you know, what is her personal growth in this book? And, um, and, and because she's being trained to fight in this generational duel, like she starts out as a warrior and she starts mm -hmm. out as somebody who is really powerful. And then about halfway through, she realizes she's never been trained to fight in like a battle. Right, right. Uh, yeah. And so she has to come to terms with that wet reservoir of fear or lack of courage or whatever in herself. And overcome exactly that. exactly yeah. she has she has been trained to fight fighting a duel under like a very specific set of conditions right. um as a, well, which is obviously like you know it's not a fight to the death it's a it's a fight to um to to judge who has the higher greater skills but it's not a fight to the death so she, she's never been in a situation where people are just like coming at her just wanting to hack her to pieces right <laughs> it is it is very very different and and i have as somebody who has never been in mortal danger can only imagine, you know, I think it takes like great nerves to even just get through it uh, without like falling apart instantly, you know, because yeah. there are people who, who probably just like scream and run in the opposite direction. I would, I probably <laughs> would, yeah, like, why not, why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, we're, we're talking about the duel and that sort of takes us back to the relationship between Mulan and her father. Big, um, which is obviously one of the other relationships because because her father like got injured in the previous generation's duel mm -hmm. and so now Mulan has to fight in this one and um, I think the one thing I mean I mostly know knew the Mulan story from the Disney movie myself so um, but in that in that one like the relationship between the father and daughter is shown to be very close and in this one you really in this novel you really like start out with them being very different and have a, a sort of reservoir of coldness between the two of them um and uh what what sort of took you in that direction uh part of it was uh by the time i by the time i figure out the terrain uh what they could eat uh you know what they were going to to actually do which landscape they're going to travel through uh and and basically all the plots and historical background stuff um I, I then suddenly realized that my characters were kind of like floating on the page. Mm. I don't know how to describe it. Um, they're doing things, they're saying things, they're, they're moving through the story, but they didn't feel like they had roots. They just felt like characters. They just felt like, uh, you know how sometimes- Like dolls you, watch, you were moving around a frame Yeah, yeah, you know how sometimes like you, watch a, you yeah. watch a movie uh, and the movie seems like nothing particularly wrong with it, but it's also not particularly like, grabbing you by the throat you're just watching these people do their thing and you're like half involved um so how like i suddenly realized like at one point like i had this problem and uh and i wasn't sure what to do with it and then i think to study for something else i actually opened up one of my own um one of my own workshops where i was teaching people how to write how to enter characters and the first advice i gave was enter via pain because that's always what worked for me. Um, how, to, how to make character real is like, everybody has pain. And when you, when you know a character's pain up front, you, there, then there's a, suddenly this connection. So then yeah. I was like, oh, that, that's what the problem is. Uh, the Mulan, as I had written her at, until at that moment, didn't have any like, inner pain that she carried. She had problems. But she yeah. didn't have she didn't have pain. So I was like, what is this girl's pain? Um, so since her mother was dead and she doesn't leave the house very much, I was like, gotta be coming from her father. 
Really? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then I was like, huh, uh, you know, because to, it, it is not natural as a child to train super hard. Right. Usually you have a parent behind you pushing very hard. So then I started really digging into the reasons why he pushed her so hard and why she agreed to be pushed so hard. What was his motivation? What was her motivation? What was, and, and what was their relationship that, you know, so instead of them being really close, they are close, obviously, but they are, mm. but you see from the beginning that there are certain things they don't say to each other, mm. you know, certain things they don't acknowledge. She's, she's very obedient. She's very, um, you know, she appears to be a very good daughter and he appears to be a really good father, but it's just that there's this distance. There's what they don't say. And, and you wonder what is it that, you know, and, and that, so, so, you know, so then reader, readers wonder, what is it that lies between them? And we find out it's basically because Hua Mulan as a person literally did not exist. Um, when her, she has a twin brother in this book, and when her twin brother died, it is her name that was struck off the registers and the rolls. And uh, his name remained. And whenever, you know, whenever she had to go out, she had to dress up as a man and go by, you know, his name. And so, uh, so to her inner pain was always that she was always afraid that her father sees her as an inferior replacement for her right. brother. At the end of the book, we finally learned it's something else altogether. But because of that lack of communication, which is something fairly typical in Asian families, because of that lack of communication, she was under a mistaken impression her whole life. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that distance and that sense of perhaps inferiority and the, the fear that she may never be what her, you know, sufficient in her in and of herself. That was the pain she carried alongside. Now she had something to carry to drive her alongside her exterior problems of the war right. and the conscription. That's really, there's a line I think about a lot um, from Emily Dickinson. I like a look of agony because I know it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, think that, I think that's really like when you're writing, like if you can bring in that truth, whatever it is, whatever that pain is, people aren't usually mm -hmm. aren't faking it. And then readers right, right. really connect with that. Right, right. And, yeah. and, and because everybody carry around a lot of pain. So we, yeah. you know, immediately we, we know what's real. Then, then that's when the characters also become real. Right. Well, that leads me to something I remember we talked about in the editing um, toward the end of the book, like, you you talked about how often forgiveness recurs as a theme in your novels like because milan and her father have to kind of mutually forgive each other or or she has to forgive him she, has to forgive. Yeah, she, like, she didn't do anything wrong <laughs> yeah right, right. She has to forgive him. Um, when did you first notice this theme in your work and and now are you like surprised when it happens or do you like try to build it in or um I think I noticed it like very early on because uh, I started in romance and I tend to write a lot of uh, uh, reunited lovers uh, in mm. which something didn't work out the first time. Right. So why didn't it work out first time? And uh, I typically do not like it if they are separated by circumstances. I much prefer that they had trespassed against each other in one right. way or the other. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, so, so very, very early on, I realized that it's just something that interests me. Um, because I think forgiveness is actually the greatest test of the human heart. Mm. Like everybody you love, I, I don't know whether you can name a single person you love who hasn't done you wrong in some way, or you have done them wrong in some way, simply because the people you love are the people closest to you. Mm. And as we move through life, it's hard not to like injure those around us or be injured by them in turn, one way or the other. Um, so then how do you move through life and still be relatively happy among people who have hurt you, who love you, but who have also hurt you. They may have loved you the wrong way. They may have hurt you in spite of, you know, loving you, or they really, maybe they weren't good to you. Right. Uh, that, that also they happens. Um, deliberately. Yeah. So it, it is actually the greatest test of the human heart. It's actually the greatest test of a person's growth uh -huh. to, um, to see whether they can forgive, what they forgive now, what they could not forgive later, or at least, you know, it's whether it's forgiving others or forgiving themselves, um, you know, to find that peace that had eluded them earlier. Um, yeah, so that's what I think. There's, because character arc 
uh, anytime you write a book with growth, right? Uh, character, characters are growing. And, and there's just no greater test of growth. It is actually harder to forgive, I think, than to find your courage in battle. Mm. Because you've got to stand outside that immediate situation. You've right, got to right. Look because at because it. sometimes, sometimes yeah. courage can come out of nowhere, but forgiveness typically cannot come out of nowhere. Right. Yeah. You really have to work on yourself. You really have to, um, uh, like, your heart has to grow, you know, yeah. to, uh, yeah. That's to really understand. powerful. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. So that's why it, that's why it fascinates me. That's why it always somehow make its way into into my books. Uh, to because um, I think deep down I am a grand romantic. <laughs> <laughs> and it is like the the happy you know H E A is happy happy endings is what we're right, always right. looking for. And it's what right. Except using. except I'm also a cynic, so I need to see people earn their. Um, right. Not necessarily earn their happily ever after, but to earn their happy new beginning. Yeah. Right. To let's say you know we have come overcome all this, we start new. That's like you know more problems will happen, but a new beginning is truly a gift. I think. Oh. So uh, the movie. What did you make of it? The new movie. <laughs> <laughs> what did, you, did you see it? And what did you think? Like I've, I've I seen all sorts of opinions all over. The I world. saw it, and I'm not sure what to make of it. <laughs> frankly um i thought the performances were good yeah i think i think every every um every performer in there really did their best and they all did really well um uh, i liked a little bit of romance that we got uh but story-wise story-wise i am not sure that all that magic and fantasy and the the phoenix and the witch like like, I, like I understood i understood the point of the witch um what did you take being, her point being to a, being a cup hers was the counterpart to mulan it is it is basically saying you know if you don't let people who have potential and who have power develop naturally then they will develop into something unnatural and anti-social mm. which is a good message it's yeah. it's just that i'm not sure whether the way they delivered it like worked as a story completely. What did you think of it? I thought it was very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cinematography wise, it was also well done. Yes. It was beautifully shot and all of those sort of things. And, and obviously like no expense was spared and such. Um, and I would say I enjoyed it while I was watching it. And, but then also I, I could hear my editor brain going on it like, <laughs> But if they knew where the, <laughs> you know, like if she, if she, like if the witch or the spirit could shape shift into any sort of form, why couldn't they have just sent him in to murder the emperor, sent her in to murder the emperor from the beginning? Right. And why does she have to like sacrifice her life to yeah. catch that sword at the end? Uh, because she could just like, a few birds would have knocked that sword off its course. <laughs> right. Um, so the, I felt like there were a lot of plot holes when I thought of <laughs> And also, Milan, you did an avalanche, which was cool, but then you brought it back down to your own. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was like, my, my, after the avalanche, I was like, did any of her own people survive? I, I seriously yeah. doubt it. They didn't seem that far from the, the enemy. Yeah. Um, and also, afterwards, I did a little research. I was like, the, the house they were living in, the, their village, their round house, that was not a northern China thing. So I, so I did a little research, and uh, it was... It was actually uh, in a place very, in one of the very southerly provinces of China, very local to that place only. Oh. And, and since they are fighting the Rurong, the south of China was not involved in that fight. <laughs> she had a journey like thousands of miles yeah, yeah, to get to the border. Yeah, she would literally have to journey thousands of miles by herself right. to get to where she, like cross the, cross the river that divided the two dynasties and, and all that. So it was like, from from a from an aspect of whether they got the history and culture correct, it's like there's some stuff like this various slightly off kilter things. So, yeah, there's a, there's some pretty <laughs> vicious Twitter threads going around about it, and, uh, and I, I didn't I didn't I didn't check them up before I started because I was like you know let me let me not uh, bias myself to create right. against it. But yeah, right. it's, it's just something slightly off kilter, and I have to say to this day to this day. As a um, person who is both fluent and literate in Chinese, I do not know 
what's the equ Chinese, actual Chinese equivalent of bring honor to the family. I do not know. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I've been told, do not lose face for the family. But I have uh -huh. no idea what, you know, bring honor to the honor. family means. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> how, how you would say that, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, they're, 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 they're like sort of, there are sort of um, terms that maybe I can, I can, like there, there's a term like more like bring a shine to the family, but but this honor thing that that that, that tend to populate itself so grandly in all the Western adaptation of Chinese things, I'm just like, what is this honor they're talking about? Huh. I wonder where that came from, because probably yeah, yeah, you know, it was like the God. I always think about the Godfather and Lord of the Rings as these two stories that introduced a bunch of cliches that everybody who was influenced by them then reproduces, kind of. And if you look at the know, if you just... look at the originals, then the the originals are actually great. But they but I I actually came to them after seeing a lot of the the copies of uh, them. Uh, uh, right, and right. And so right. they read like cliches to me when I actually saw them. And it, it seems like sort of the same thing. Like probably there was a or honor text somewhere that maybe maybe I don't because know. because honor is not even like a chinese concept uh, I, I, huh. I, I face face definitely is. right <laughs> uh. well but i think the movie did pretty well for them over the weekend so that's good mm -hmm. that's good with yeah your and my money from me and Lo <laughs> <laughs> me Hopefully people will want to know more about Mulan. Well, what to read a novel. Um, here, I'm going to look at the Q&A real quick and we'll see. Um, sure, sure. What, what, uh, and and everybody, saying. thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, somebody asked, uh, was there historic evidence of women mastering sword skills in this era? Like, are, are there, are there historic women warriors or soldiers, I guess we might say? There are definitely, um, in the Tang Dynasty, um, I don't know if there's specific evidence of women sword masters, but in the Tang Dynasty, uh, or like a little bit before the Tang Dynasty, when the power struggle was going on, um, there's actually a princess who led an army, you know, uh, to defeat a revolt against her brother. Oh wow! So so it is you know this this happened about two hundred years after uh, the time of Mulan or something like that two or three hundred years so yeah so so it, it it's happened before and uh, and uh, female emperors one of the most one of the most famous female emperors actually happened in the middle of the Tang Dynasty also um so it's you know it's not uh it's not unusual for women to how how to say it. They are, it is exceptional, but it's not unheard of at all for the most powerful person in China to be a woman, um, right. which happened again toward the end of the Qing dynasty. Um, so as for, as for uh, whether there's female um, martial arts, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've never asked myself that question. We just, we just, Assume that, uh, I'd assume that in, in wuxia they exist. <laughs> right, right. Well, I will say right now, if you want to write a YA novel about this princess who fights her brother, <laughs> I am here for that. Um, we should, let, let's see, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, another person asked, uh, how much of the, uh, uh, another research question, like how much of the marriage negotiations was taken from modern day versus the ancient customs? Marriage negotiations? Uh, like marriage, has, like marriage has, has always been like a, a matter of uh, agreement between families rather than between mm. um, individuals. So I'm not sure what aspect of it uh, the questioner is, is referring to. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, in, that's in, all the detail I had, so. Right, right. Um, but but yeah. definitely in, in that era, um, it's 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 your parents who arrange for your marriage. You you do not go out and and do that. Uh, typically, I'm not saying there are exceptions, but typically it's your parents who arrange it for you. And even if you like somebody, right, the first thing you you do is you try to see if your parents will arrange it for you because your the 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 the, the family of your intended will not take you seriously if you don't bring your parents into the bargain because you marry into a family, not in not to an individual. Yeah, right. 
Uh, how long did the research take to complete? The research is never complete. Um, yeah. I research I, I research enough to start writing, and then I keep researching as I go. Uh, for for this book, uh, um, I think because because the plot was giving me so much problems, so I find myself doing the the contrary. I was like desperately trying to give the people something to eat, my character something to eat, and was having a terrible time finding out what they could eat. <laughs> because everything I could immediately think of from my own childhood turned out from, from, to be from the Colombian exchange. Like they were new world foods, like you know, stir fried potatoes, no. Tomatoes, no. Um, sunflower seeds, no. Like even like, uh, um, even, even say for example, watermelon seeds, which is also something you can uh, stir fry and eat in China turned out to be like came from Africa in the 10th century, which is like five centuries after the setting of my book. Right. So, so there was desperately looking for various things. I, I got like, I think the most number of, uh, most number of books I, I got via interlibrary loan from the library, um, uh -huh. all concerned what they could eat and drink. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I think between the first and second draft, you emailed me and you were like, we have to take out all the chairs. They didn't have chairs at this time. Yeah, they, 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 um, yeah. They, yeah exactly. That, that was the last thing I found out. And it was, it was the book was almost already done. It was, yeah. not, it was not between the first and second draft. It was like between the, between the, um, was between the, uh, was between the copy edit and the galleys or something. So it was oh, really? the very end of the process. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I was watching a, a Chinese fantasy drama on Netflix. And halfway through, I suddenly thought to myself, holy smoke, why is everybody sitting on the floor? I mean, not necessarily on the floor, but they, they sit before these, um, they sit on race platforms, but in front of them, there will be like only this low table, like, like this, this high low table. And yeah. then they just sit on a, a cushion on this, on, this low, um, on this low platform in front of this low table. And a lot of times, if they sit formally, they're actually sitting on their knees. Like how you see the Japanese sitting, so which I guess must have like gone from China, but then later Chinese said, oh, chairs are much better. <laughs> um, right. so, um, so yes, so then I actually did some research and realized, oh, chairs as a thing also didn't come into like popular usage until after my time. So we had to get rid of all the chairs and have them like sit much lower. <laughs> <laughs> that is... That is devotion. That is that's, getting that, it right. You, you, never, you never know what you don't know. That's a problem. You don't know right. what you don't know. Yeah. And finally, somebody asked, has your book been translated into Chinese or have, or, which I don't this think book. it has. Yeah. This book. This, this book, book has not been translated into Chinese as far as yeah. I know. I have had other books being translated into like complex Chinese out of right. Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe at some point in the future. We'll see. Maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think that is uh, all the time we have today. So I'll just add um, so to everybody who's tuning in, thank you for joining us. Thank um, you so very next, much. Yeah. And uh, our next Tea Time Talk will be on Thursday, September 17th. We'll have authors Monica Brown, Catherine Russell Brown, and Sandra Nickel in conversation with their editor, Louise May, about uh, their recently released picture book biographies. So we'll see you back here this time next week at 3 p.m. Eastern. Take care and thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Have a nice day. Bye.